Chapter 3 Nick tilted his head toward the noise. Was it the leaves hushing and rustling in the breeze, or was it running water? He stepped forward and other sounds emerged, gurgling, trickling, and the crystal music of water dashing among stones. Spying a wide, shallow stream through a gap in the trees, he ran to the banks and dropped to his knees to drink from a bowl he formed with his hands. When he finally looked up, he was surprised to see a small farm on the other side of the stream, the first hint of humanity in two days. His impulse was to hide among the trees so that he might creep back at night like a mouse for shelter and food. But a second glance revealed that the farm had been forsaken some time ago. The fence around the pasture was in disarray, and no cows or horses were in the fields. The thatched roof of the one-room farmhouse was partly collapsed, and the walls of the round stone wall were crumbling. In front of the tiny house, a rusty axe was buried deep in the largest of several tree stumps. A few old pieces of wood were scattered around. Nick wondered if the farmer had simply given up on trying to draw life from this stony soil and walked away. Or maybe, he thought, with a painful memory rising in his heart, the sickness has come here, too. Perhaps the remains of the people who dwelt here could still be found in the house that became their tomb. Hopping from rock to rock, Nick crossed the stream. The farm stood in the shadow of the ridge that he'd seen from afar. Rocks were plentiful here. The farmer had used them to build low walls around his vegetable fields. But now weeds and saplings and shrubs were reclaiming the land. A pang of hunger clawed at Nick's gut. Nobody had tended that field for years, but some vegetables might be growing wild there yet. He raced over and was clawing through the weeds, uprooting anything that looked like a carrot, turnip, or onion, when he heard something from the direction of the ridge. The high clack, click, clack of a stone striking other rocks. He turned and saw a man standing halfway down the slope, perfectly still. The stranger's eyes followed the tumbling stone until it came to rest at the bottom, settling among a pile of other pebbles and boulders that had rolled down over the years. A prickly chill swept over the back of Nick's neck. This man might have been creeping stealthily toward him until one loose stone had given him away. Nick lowered himself until he was hidden among the weeds. When he lifted his head again to peer out, he saw the stranger coming forward again. The man moved casually, with his hands thrust in his pockets. He kicked a few stones ahead of him as he descended, as if he didn't care how much clamor he made now that his presence was revealed. He reached the bottom and sauntered toward the farm. The closer he came, the more nervous Nick felt. The man was large and strong, and despite his fine clothes and his off-hand demeanor, he still seemed like a predator ready to spring. There was a sheath at the stranger's waist with the handle of a knife jutting from the top. His smile didn't belong on the same face as those cold blue eyes. Has he seen me? Nick wondered, sinking lower into the weeds. The stranger's gaze fixed on the axe in the tree stump, and he ambled toward it, whistling. He let the pack that was slung across his shoulder slip to the ground, and he gripped the handle. He gave it a little tug, then a stronger yank, but the axe would not budge. The wood had swollen since the day long ago when, with a final swing, the farmer sank his blade deep. Like Excalibur in its stone, the stranger said, but not to himself. He spoke loudly, projecting his voice toward the garden. It was an intelligent voice, but not a friendly voice. Nick flattened himself on the ground, wishing he'd run at the first sight of the intruder. Come on out, boy. I saw you from up there, you know. Besides, you're not as good at hiding as you think. I can see the path you made through the weeds. Nick had seen rabbits freeze in place, hoping to go unnoticed when someone approached. Now he felt as they must. He knew he should bolt, because this stranger radiated danger, the way a bonfire threw off heat. But he thought about it a moment too long. He heard a single footstep coming toward him, and the stranger was suddenly hurtling over the wall. Nick jumped to his feet and turned to run, but powerful hands seized him from behind. 
one on his arm and the other grabbing a handful of hair. Hold on now, pup. Mr. Finch won't hurt you unless you try to run away. He accentuated his words by twisting Nick's hair so fiercely that it felt like the back of his head had caught fire. Nick stopped struggling. I will let go of you now, said the man, and I want you to turn around and look at me. If you run, I'll just snatch you up again, so there's no point to it, is there? Do you understand me? Nick nodded, and the man released his grip. Nick turned to face the stranger who called himself Finch. Finch looked Nick over from head to toe, and he seemed to approve of what he saw. Oh, you'll do, won't you? Can't weigh more than four stone, can you? Got twigs for arms. Is there any strength in them? What, what do you want from me? Nick said, panting. He rubbed the arm that Finch had seized. Five bruises, one for each finger, had blossomed there. Finch painted a broad, friendly smile on his face. Just a little favor, that's all. Tell me your name. Nick. Nick, a fine name. Is this your farm? Is this where you live? Nick shook his head. So what are you doing here, then? Are your mother and father around? Again, Nick shook his head. What about friends? Any friends around here? Another shake. That's a shame, but you know what, Nick? I could be your friend. My name's Finch. I've been looking for a kid just like you, and here you are in the first place I looked. That makes me think it was meant to be. You see, I need a favor that only a little fellow like you can do. A big fellow wouldn't do for this job. Finch flashed his smile again, but Nick's fear grew nonetheless. Finch seemed to sense that his charm wasn't working and his eyes narrowed. Think about it, Nick. You need me, too. I know you do. See, I understand everything about you, though I never met you before this moment. You lost your family somehow. Did they abandon you? No, it was the plague, wasn't it? Nick felt his entire body go rigid and wished he'd been able to control himself better because Finch's eyes narrowed further and his smile spread a little wider. Thought so, Finch said. The villagers probably burned down your house without bothering to bury the dead. Then you were on your own and there was nobody to take care of you. Maybe you asked passerby if they could give you a place to sleep, a place to come home to, but nobody ever did. Who needs a lost child like you in times like these, and a plague orphan at that? They had their own problems, their own mouths to feed, so they turned you away. The best they would do was toss you a scrap of bread, and you'd watch as the family hurried away, not looking back. And you were jealous of those children with their full bellies and their clean faces and their little toys. Nick clenched his teeth and pressed his lips together. I won't let you see my face, he thought, and he turned his back on Finch. But Finch stepped closer and whispered over his shoulder. So you went on begging for food, wandering around, searching for a place to call home. Did a little stealing, too, didn't you? Anything to survive. And now look at you, scavenging in an old vegetable garden like an animal. But think about it, Nick. Winter will follow. And what will you do when there's no food to scrounge? You with your cheeks sunken in and all your ribs showing already. How do you keep warm when the nights are cold enough to freeze spit and you've got no coat to wear, no blanket to wrap around you, no fire to cozy up to? Nick's head bent low. His knobby shoulders were trembling. Nick, I was that way once too. Shunned, hungry, hunted. I figured I had a choice to make, and I chose to fight back, survive any way I could. You understand? I've done some wrong along the way, but the world did me a load of wrong first, and maybe I'm just paying the world back in kind. Nick wiped his cheeks with his sleeve and turned to look Finch angrily in the eye. Finch leaned over a little, putting his face closer to Nick's. Come with me, lad. I've got friends who were all just like you, once. We live in a forest over that ridge. You can join us. We'll be your family. You can stay warm by our fire and we'll feed you right. Meat, biscuits, soup, you name it. How would a nice hot bowl of venison stew go down right now, Nick? At the suggestion of food, real meat, Nick's mouth suddenly flooded with saliva. 
He swallowed it before he could spill out over his lips. There's something you have to understand first, though, Nick. You see, we're a band of thieves. That's the plain truth. If you come with me, you'll be a thief, too. Pretty soon I'll have a little job for you to do. Nothing you can't handle, but you have to do it, and you have to do it my way. And in our band, my way is the only way. You understand? Have we a bargain, little thief? Finch stuck out his hand. With his eyes narrowed into slits, he stared down and waited to see if Nick would shake it.